Hello everyone, I'm Pepe and I'm so glad to be here at this Rapid Cities Responsive Architectures Conference for Dubai, this year held in a virtual version. Now I would like to start sharing my screen to show you my slides. I hope you enjoy this presentation. So the title of my work is Urban Planning Sustainability Framework, OPSUP, for new elements. This work has been conducted by myself, Dr. Ba Martin Van Riewijk, and Dr. Anna Mijik, all of us from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Imperial College London. First, I would like to talk about the outline that we're going to follow in today's presentation. So I would like to start with some introduction and background of the work. Secondly, we'll show what's this urban planning sustainability framework and its different parts. Third, I will explain what's the Camellia Research Project and our main case study, Tensmith. Fourth, we'll see some urban design scenarios and the results that we got. And at the end, I also talk about some conclusions on the future stages. Talking about the background and motivation of this work, there are two main challenges nowadays around every city in this world. One of them is climate change or even climate crisis, and the second is population growth. These are threatening the water security in our urban environment, and that means that we need to develop some sustainable urban developments. In the UK, this is particularly critical in London. In there, we find two main barriers to develop this sustainable urban development. The first one is the difficulty in understanding the urban system complexity. But on the other hand, we also found that there is a lack of stakeholder in involvement. A new common conceptual from framework that combines first the planning system and operation in the UK, Second, the sustainable urban design solutions. And third, an integrated evaluation to grid is being proposed. Before, what are the challenges of these urban interactions? As we can see here in figure one, we can see that urban infrastructure systems, which generally are composed by land, water services infrastructure or housing, are part of a very complex process and to be managed efficiently, we need to rethink it from a systems perspective. One of the methods to analyze the sustainability level are urban ecosystem services, which inform the urban infrastructure design and operation. But how is this translated into this urban planning sustainability framework, what we call UPSUF? So as I already introduced in our previous, my previous slide, UPSUF is composed by three main clusters. The first one is the planning system process, the one here in gray. The second is the design solutions in green. And third, we have the integrated evaluation toolkit. All of them follow the actions happening at governance and decision making level. And it's a kind of an iterative process that links the design solutions with an evolving evaluation toolkit. So very briefly, these design solutions are what compose blue-green urban design, which is blue-green infrastructure, sustainable urban form, sustainable construction, and ecological patterns. These move from an existing pre-development baseline to a new urban development. But once we have this new, the design for this new urban development, we need to evaluate it in order to know if this is sustainable or not. To evaluate this, we have a selection of tools that evaluate the urban ecosystem services and urban natural capital. But on the other hand, they also provide a blueprint infrastructure monetary prediction. And we can even add some systems thinking and population models. These combined with approved certification as BREAM, LEED, CASBI, or Passive House can even include this sustainability criteria. Another innovation seen inside this framework is the, that all these solutions and the metrics are represented especially in a GIS tool. So once we have these results from this integrated evaluation toolkit, we need to ask ourselves, 
is this considered sustainable development? In case it is, then this is the end of the process. But if it's not, then we need to change the design of the development, come back to the design solutions and get a new or, a new or development. And here is where this iterative process will be conducted until the answer is yes. Just very briefly to see in more detail what are the different parts of this framework, we can see here how the UK planning system works generally. So there are a series of urban stakeholders, mainly divided in private and public sector and also in decision makers and statutory consultees. Being one of the main figures, developers and urban players in one side, which, de which design the urban development project, and then who are the ones who submit their urban development project for planning application once the cost and viability are assessed. At this stage are the local planning authorities or residents who need to decide if they want to grant this planning permission for this urban development project or not, based on the local plans and neighborhood plans. So as you can see, this also follows a kind of an iterative process similar to our framework. On the other hand, we can see here in table one, what will be an example of these blue-green urban design solutions, the cluster, the cluster in, in, in green. And th these are divided between sustainable design solutions and what will be more traditional kind of solutions. So just to give you an example, a street trees will be a sustainable solution while a traditional solution will be sterile corridors with hard and not permeable roads and pavements. So the idea is to have a good balance between these two uh, types of solutions, both in the blue-green infrastructure, urban form and construction. Then, depending on the solution selected, we'll get a different number of urban ecosystem services. Following this argument, one of the novel parts of this framework is what will happen if we combine sustainable solutions coming from buildings, which are sustainable urban form and sustainable construction, with the ones more about public infrastructure, which will be blue-green infrastructure, which is what's around these buildings. And we realize that if we combine this type of solutions, a larger number of urban ecosystem services are provided. So just to give you an example, if we combine blue and green roofs with building dimensions, uh, surface properties, and so on, we get six urban ecosystem services. While if these were studied just by their own, this number will be lower. And what are these urban ecosystem services that we study in our evaluation toolkit? So based on literature, we took two important sources. One is uh, Killer et al. 19, 2019, and the other one is Bosopic et al. 2017. And we put the 10 main urban ecosystem services for our framework. So this color coding shows like the ones in green are the ones that are in both sources, while the ones in orange are just in one of the sources. But we also considered it was important. So just to give you an insight of what are the most important ecosystem services for UPSUF are urban air quality, urban heat island mitigation, urban water quality, urban water supply, flood mitigation and stormwater management, recreation and well-being, urban ag agriculture, biodiversity, aesthetics, and resources efficiency. So the, depending on the level of these services that we provide by our design, then it will be considered more able to be built or not. In this slide, I would like to start talking about Camellia. Camellia is a large research project led by Imperial College London, and it comes from Community Water Management for a Livable London. It involves a large number of partners. Among them, we have UCL, University of Ox Oxford, BGS, also other kind of industry, as Thames Water or also organization, institutional organizations as Enfield Council or Environmental Environment Agency, Peabody and so on. 
And the main, the key, the key point from Camellia is to have citizens at the core of our design and studies. Camellia has four case studies, and one of them is Thamesmith. For the ones who doesn't know what stand, where is Thamesmith, Thamesmith is in southeast London, and it's a 750 hectares neighborhood. It's between two boroughs, Greenwich and Bexley, and most of the housing are social. Nowadays, around 45,000 people live there in around 16,000 households. However, the idea of Peabody, who is the house associations who owns most of the land, is to double this number. Another important feature of this, of this neighborhood is that it has 150 hectares of blue and green space. And this is translated with a large natural capital value of around 306 million pounds or 457 pounds per person per year. Transmit it was envisaged as the image on the on the right on the at the end of the 60s as a very prolific um, city of the future. However, nowadays is in a very deteriorated state. Um, so one of the biggest development plans that are going to happen inside Thamesmead is Thamesmead Waterfront Development Plan. This is currently a 100 hectare site full of blue and green space with three kilometers of river waterfront, uh, two lakes, a network of canals, and it's projected to build there around 1,000 new homes in a 8 billion new development. As I said before, this is fully managed and owned by Peabody, and this will include even a new DLR station that will connect with London Centre. And one of the key things here is like currently it's fenced, so it cannot be enjoyed by citizens although it's full of blue and green space. And the, what the image is below is how developers envisage this space to be. So as you can see, this virtual image is full of buildings that perhaps are not respecting that much this natural environment. So coming back to our framework, in order to know the different types of urban ecosystem services provided to this development, and this being especially represented in GIS, what we did is to choose one of the ur urban ecosystem services and natural capital evaluation tools to evaluate different types of scenarios. It's what we call urban design scenarios for Tesmith Waterfront Development Plan. And the, the tool that we used was NCPT, it's coming from Natural Capital Planning Tool. And first, as we already say, we need also to study how is the pre-development land use in this in this space in order to see how will be the changes that we do in a in some post-development scenarios. So the pre-development stage, which is the one that we can see here in this map, most of the land is developable brownfield land and has all those waste landfill, which means that we cannot build in this space. We have also some blue space, amenity grassland and protected wildland around here that must be preserved and cannot be changed either. But on the other hand, most of the existing buildings will be redesigned apart from a water pump station here. And most of the paved areas will be also redesigned apart from a Thames path that comes through the three kilometers river waterfront. So starting from a more adverse scenario is the scenario one. And as we can see here in figure eight, most of the land will be built up area. It is in high, medium and low density. And there is no sustainable urban form at all. Most of the land uses from before disappear and new ones emerge. And this is done with traditional ways of construction. So it means non-sustainable buildings. As we say, most of the land will be preserved and what before was waste landfill, now will create this new parkland space with a pond. Secondly, we present this second scenario too, but it's titled like uh, intermediate, 
and it has the same number of hectares of buildings and building space, but with the difference that they are changed instead of being traditional way of construction. Now these are with green roofs, green walls. And before where what it was impermeable uh, paved areas or kind of traditional roads, they are now local green roads or gardens. Here we found one of the limitations of the NCPT tool because it doesn't give a specific types of blue green infrastructure land uses. The third scenario is what we call favorable. And here we design a completely new urban layout where we did, where we present a more compact uh, density, still with buildings with green roofs and green, buildings with green roads, and with a lot of blue green infrastructure around it, which means, which is based on literature, one of the most sustainable options for future cities. So we are here trying to find this balance. But finally, we also wanted to test what you will be even preserving more woodland and more natural space. So in this one here, buildings completely disappear, which will mean we'll need to have a kind of more um, high rise buildings close to the river, more compact buildings, but still with green roofs and green walls and sustainable type of construction. And the rest of the buildings that are kind of behind of, of the neighborhood are envisaged as more uh, medium density buildings. So how these different scenarios uh, are studied in the NCPT? What are the ecosystem services that we that are provided by them? So if we look at this table here with the four scenarios, we can see that in this scenario one, most of the ecosystem services studied are in red, which means that we are not providing them at all, so only getting some recreation, and that is plain because, as I, as I said before, this plot is currently fenced, so as soon as we open the fences, this will be enjoyed by our citizens, and then it obviously some is going to create some global climate regulation. But in this scenario two, just changing the type of buildings and making them with sustainable solutions, we start to see more green scores with as aesthetic values, or so air quality regulation, or local climate regulation. But then when we move to scenario three, most of the ecosystem services are positive, apart from harvested products and biodiversity. This is easy, easily explained by the limitations that we say, because obviously before there were not any type of agriculture on this land, and biodiversity is not considered either because we are putting gardens instead of properly proper blue green infrastructure. But even with these limitations, when we move to S scenario four, when we are in a more conservative way and preserving more natural environment, is when we got all of the urban ecosystem services. So once we got this conclusion, what will be the future stages of our work? So first, we would like to move to another case study inside Camellia. And this is another neighborhood in North London called Enfield, where a new urban regeneration plan called Meridian Water is going gonna, is gonna to be developed as well. So this urban planning sustainability framework, UPSU, is currently at the proof of concept stage, which means that it's proof as an innovative and effective method of sustainability assessment for new urban developments in the UK planning context. However, Initial studies that combine NCPD with numerical results and scores with these QGIS maps show that these tools are still lacking some important functionalities and there remains a need for a revised method. So this still needs some revision. On the other hand, it's also proved that urban natural capital and urban ecosystem services assessment is very crucial to analyze the impacts of these new urban developments on the environment especially at the early stages of the design. So some of the steps that we would like to develop are first, develop the concept of water neutral urban development within a new scientific model called city plan. And this will be linked with one existing model also developed in our team called city watch. 
On the other hand, we would like to also add more a more dynamic evaluation of the development, plus some cost benefit analysis of the design solution. Then, including this Enfield case, new case study that I just showed before, it will enable a more diverse, strongly proof and collaborative type of research. And finally, we would like also to start engaging with public bodies to approach this framework and have a real insight of what will be its real life application. And this is the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoy this and please do not hesitate to contact me or any other member of the team if you have any question. See you. Thank you. Bye bye.